That was the fastest transformation ever. Welcome to our front room and our music studio <laughs> and our kitchen. Really glad you guys are here. Brand new series we're starting today called Mama Always Said. And the premise of this series is really this. In the course of the next number, number of weeks, this month, I want to share with you things that God has put on my heart over the years and in specific, you know, specifically for right now for you, for our church family, as, you know, quote unquote, the mom of this house, so to speak. What are things that, you know, in this season of our lives, Pastor Jeff and I, in this season, he turned 62 today, by the way. Did we already mention that? In this season, you know, we, we've always had a pastoral heart toward all of you guys and toward the church. Even before we started the church, we really just had that. God had put that in our heart. But now in this season of our lives, I think we're feeling a little bit more of that motherly, fatherly kind of a thing towards all of you and what God wants to do in and through your lives and then as our, our church as a, you know, as a whole. And um, with our kids now grown and beginning their own families, I think it's the season of life we're in. And then it's sort of like, now we've got some experience. Now we, now we know some of the things that we did over the years worked. You know, a lot of times back in the day, we didn't teach a lot on raising kids because we were raising kids and we weren't 100% sure if our methods were working. And we wanted to wait till the verdict was in and then we could say, okay, now that did work, so here's what we could say about that. And that's kind of the season we're in a little bit, at least for this month. It's like, what are things that worked? For, from my heart to your heart, you know, mom of the house type of thing, if I was sitting down with you in my front room or at the kitchen table and we were just going to have a chat and I was just going to share life stuff, what are some things that I think would help you? And this, what we're going to talk about today is the beginning of that. And I think today's is one of those funny topics because it'll probably be a little bit surprising in a way. You might think of all the things you could talk about, you're talking about this. But when I really did think about, like, what are those life-giving, like, just nuggets, secrets to the Christian life, to a vibrant walk with the Lord, to having a walk with the Lord, in my case now, 40-some years, to be walking with the Lord for 40-some years and to still love the Lord and to still feel his love, and, like, I'm in it to win it with the Lord. I wouldn't go back if you paid me. I only wish I'd come to the Lord 10 years sooner. Like, it only gets better and better and better with the Lord. But I think the only way that becomes our testimony is if we're implementing what I'm going to talk about today. I think it's so simple and so basic, and yet you'll see, I believe, it's the oxygen for our Christian life, what we're going to share with you guys today. So with all that said, that's kind of where we're going in the, in the whole series. And so I'm just sort of welcoming you into our front room. I'll sit, I'll stand, we'll talk. I just want to um, like have a little chat. And then also, I want us to kind of experience together, Lord willing, just want to experience together kind of, a, kind of want to demonstrate, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it, how to do some of the things I'm talking about today, okay? So it'll be a little bit interactive, I think, in that regard. All right, with all that said, there you go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for each and every person that's here. Lord, thank you that you know each and every one of us intimately, you are acquainted with all of our ways. And Lord, you know how long different ones of us have been walking with you. You know the season of life we're in. You know what we need. And I ask you, Lord, to take this message and really every message of this month. Lord, customize it from your heart, more importantly, most importantly, from your heart to their heart. And I pray, Lord, you'll use me as your vessel to communicate to your people. May eternal fruit be the result of our time together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody that agreed said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we're going to talk about a very surprising subject. I want to talk to you about the sound track of your life. I want to talk to you about the melodies, the music, the songs, the beat, the groove, that thing on the inside of you that you live by. All of us have one. We all have a soundtrack of some sort. We're living by some kind of a theme. We're living by some kind of a score, a musical score. We're living by something. But what we're going to see is the Lord wants us to be very intentional, to live by this soundtrack, this score that he's written for our lives. And man, I can just tell you from my own personal experience, I know what it's like to not have the soundtrack. Well, I know what it's like to have a different soundtrack. Let's put it that way. 
I know what it's like to have a different soundtrack, and then I know what it's like to have the God song type of soundtrack, and I think many of you know it as well, but because it's so simple and basic, and it's actually really fun, um, sometimes it can be overlooked as being like a secret, a secret to the Christian life, but it really, really, truly is. So with that, if you got your Bibles, let me share a couple of scriptures with you. In Proverbs 1, verses 8 and 9, let me just read this to you. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9 says, My child, listen when your father corrects you. Don't neglect your mother's instruction. What you learn from them will crown you with grace and be a chain of honor around your neck. And then Proverbs 6, 20 says, My son, obey your father's commands and don't neglect your mother's instructions. So that's true. I mean, I think we have a pretty great dad of the house here at Valley Family Church. I think Pastor Jeff does a really great job leading the charge and modeling, I think, for all of us, modeling what it means to be a Christian man, a godly man, a father, a husband, a pastor. And my role then as the mom is to do the same, and then not just here at the church family, but within our own family. And I'll share some personal examples of our own family, how as the mom I felt like it was my role to help create the atmosphere in our home. And I think most, of, most moms, you know that. You know part of you know, what you do is you create the mood and the atmosphere and you know, the oxygen, if you will, in your home. And, and we found in raising our kids, our four kids, all grown, now married, starting their own families, what we found is a massive part of that for our family was music. And, and the funny thing is we're not really a singing, like none of us like, can sing that well. Luke is probably the best singer in our family. He used to lead worship here. But, I mean, like, we, it's not like, oh, yeah, well, that's because you guys all, like, have a traveling musical band where you go sing. No, we don't. That's the beauty of it. We are not good singers. <laughs> and that's the encouragement to you, too, because you might think, well, she's going to talk about music and soundtracks and songs, and we don't sing. That is a very small percentage of people in this room who actually sing well. And that's true. But, well, <laughs> but that's true. The beauty of it is this subject is for everybody. We're going to find out the Bible's loaded with all kinds of encouragement for you and I to have a song and a melody in our heart, and it really is not contingent on how good we can sing. It's more contingent on a relationship with the Lord, and that, that will make sense as, as we get into it, okay? So uh, Proverbs 4.23, just a couple of introductory thoughts. Proverbs 4.23 says this, talks about guarding your heart. And as, you know, as I'm sharing with you, like, man, what could I tell these guys that would help them in their Christian walk? You know, 50 years from now, we're, we're with the Lord, and they've all carried on, and they've got kids and grandkids doing stuff. And what's something lasting that I could impart to you that would be meaningful? It's this verse. It's Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Our heart is our personal headquarters. This is our Grand Central Station, our heart is. It is our personal headquarters, and it's also the place that God contacts. You know, you think, if I know the Lord, and if I have a relationship with the Lord, like, what part of me has a relationship with the Lord? Like, what part of me is he communicating with? He's not necessarily communicating with our minds. God contacts us in our heart, and we also contact the Lord from our heart. Our heart is where all the issues of life come from. Any issue you have in life, financial, relational, marriage, your walk with God, health, healing, your job, your friendships, any area of life that any of us deal with, the good news is it can get resolved if we'll give attention to our heart and really pay close attention to the heart. If we'll guard our heart with all diligence, like the Bible says, because out of it flow all the issues of life, that's a good thing to know. That's a huge thing to know. Man, there's nothing more important than guarding your heart. And specifically what we're going to talk about today, nothing more important than what goes into your heart and then what comes out of your heart in terms of these melodies, these songs, these words, these lyrics, this drumbeat type of thing. In the Passion Bible, it says this, So above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, for from there flow the wellsprings of life. I think what I love about that is it makes our Christian life simple. It means that on any given day, all we have to do is locate our heart. Go, God, what's going on in my heart? Is my heart all vexed, anxious, bitter, frustrated, bored, 
angry, cynical, joyful, loving. Like, Lord, on any given day, what's going on in my heart? Because you told me to guard it with all diligence because everything else is going to come out of that. And the thing is, the truth is, there's only a couple of gates that get to our heart. We have an eye gate, we have an ear gate, and we have a mouth gate. Those are the three gates of things going in and things coming out that are connected to our heart. And this whole idea of the soundtrack of your life is connected to all three of those gates, the importance of all of those gates. So with that said, so with our family then growing up, you know, it's the mom of our house, it was really important to me to guard our kid's heart too. And so we had certain rules in our family, I'm sure like you guys do, certain rules in the family. It was like, okay, you can't ever say the word stupid. Like we did not allow, allow the word stupid in our family. Now, don't get me wrong. They found other words, but they couldn't say stupid. Um, we had certain rules about television, certain rules about music. We had rules, you know, and I say rules. I hate even to use the word rules. It was more like, no, this is just our life, you guys. We're Christians. And our goal as a family was to live a life pleasing to the Lord. That was our goal. Just let's do things that please the Lord. Now, we weren't perfect at it. I'm not saying that, but it was our heart's desire. So then that affected and that determined eye gate, ear gate, and mouth gate kind of things. And that affected music and TV and so on. So when it comes to music, it was really important to me. Like, I felt like it was really important with the kids that, uh, well, we were probably overkill. Jeff and I both were probably a little overkill on this, but I don't have any regrets about it. I would do it again just exactly the same way. But we, you know, we had a pretty high bar in what the kids could watch on TV or not watch. And they couldn't, they couldn't watch a lot but they could watch good things, things that would put good things in them, things that would not create fear. You're not gonna watch some super scary movie and then be up all night freaking out. Why would we want you to have a spirit of fear hounding you? Yeah. Let's just not watch that kind of stuff. We're not gonna listen to music or things that are gonna put anxiety or fear or hatred or rebellion in your heart. Because if everything comes out of your heart, you gotta guard what goes into your heart. And there's a lot of songs, a lot of music that would perpetuate that kind of stuff. Even, you know, there's other songs, even sometimes Christian songs to a degree, but we didn't want to perpetuate sadness. You know, there's a whole genre of music called the blues. And, you know, back in the day, I used to listen to, um, does anybody remember Linda Ronstadt? Linda Ronstadt back in the day had a lot of songs that were kind of bluesy. Janis Joplin, anybody remember Janis Joplin? I watched a documentary on Janis Joplin a few years ago, and my heart really went out to her because she was just a, such a gifted young person, and, but just so lost and seeking love and seeking God. And, you know, she died of a tragic drug overdose. Pastor Jeff and I went and saw, there's a Broadway tour of the Janis Joplin show, so we went and saw that last week, actually. And um, just because I, we feel, I mean, even though she's gone and hopefully she came to the Lord at some point, but there's just a lot of compassion for people that are so gifted and yet so searching for God. But her music was the blues. And having watched her life story in this Broadway production, her, her music was definitely the blues. And we were, you know, in talking to our kids, we we're like, guys, we grew up, Dad and I grew up listening to a lot of secular music. We were not Christians. We listened to a lot of stuff. And, but it put in us a sadness, a rebellion, a desire for drugs, and all the stuff that probably we don't want you guys to have to deal with. We're going to help guard your heart. You following this? Yeah. So anyways, we were, like I said, probably overkill, but man, we just really guarded what they listened to. And then we also were intentional about what they did listen to. So we listened to pretty much, our kids grew up pretty much listening to worship music. You know, that's, that's what we played 24 seven in our house was worship music. And thankfully worship music was getting, you know, more and more progressive. Um, but we played them the oldies too. We played them, you know, all the good old Southern gospel, Pentecostal, super fun, crazy kind of music. Like, like they grew up on it. That was their norm. But what it put in them was faith. What it put in them was joy. What it put in them was a, a happiness to serve God and to worship God. And we, you know, we listened to oldies. We'd listen to some good old Carol King or James Taylor or Carly Simon. Like our kids, you know, we can, the whole family can sing Mockingbird, okay? <laughs> Mock. Ing. Yeah, you got it. You guys, we need to practice so I can tell. Um, 
but we sang some oldies too, but we, mostly we listened to worship because we wanted to put in them joy and faith and a cognition of God and out of the abundance of the heart, everything, all the issues of life flow. This is a truth, okay? Does that make sense? So anyways, having done that, then now the fruit's in. Now I can tell you these days, our kids love the Lord. Our kids love to worship. It would not be uncommon. It would not be uncommon at all for us to walk by the kids' bedrooms back when they were all living with us or to go downstairs in the basement and to hear one of them in their bedroom listening to worship music, praising the Lord at the top of their lungs, having a prayer time with God with the worship music going. Like That was the norm. And that soundtrack of their heart was established. And so here they are now, young adults, loving God, starting families, serving the Lord. I mean, they have a real genuine relationship with the Lord. When I go back to my own personal life, when I first became a Christian, you know, I was raised as a Roman Catholic. Many of you know that. Raised as a Roman Catholic, so thankful for my upbringing as a Catholic. And then it wasn't until I was 19 years old I heard the gospel and that I could have a personal relationship with Jesus. And, you know, you guys have heard my story. And so then I accepted the Lord. He became the Lord of my life. But I didn't change much else. I'm still listening to Bad Company. It's a, it was a group. I'm still listening. I'm still listening to... Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath. I'm still listening to a lot of stuff. Now, I still also had my Carol King, James Taylor, Carly Simon stuff, my more wholesome. I had my wholesome music. I'm still listening to all that, and then God begins to get a hold of my heart. In fact, I remember reading Acts chapter 19 one time, and in Acts 19, it talked about how they took all their paraphernalia that reminded them of their old life. I'd been a Christian for about a year. And I had all my old albums. I had all my old eight tracks. Anybody else remember eight tracks? I had them all. And I, I realized, you know what? In this chapter in Acts 19, they took all their old paraphernalia, things that were reminders of their old life, their books and all their stuff. This is in the Bible. And they had a big bonfire in the middle of the city one day. They just wanted to get rid of anything that was going to hinder them in their new walk, their newness of life in Christ. I remember reading that one day, and I had this thought. I'm like, you know, I should get rid of these old albums. I listen to these, and they're so contrary to what God's doing in my life now. I feel kind of like I'm living in two worlds. And I just thought, I just need to say goodbye to my old life. So my roommate and I took all of our albums, and, you know, we didn't want to give them to somebody else because we didn't want them to listen to them. And so we're going to throw them away. They're expensive. It was an expensive trip to the dumpster. We went to the dumpster, and just like Frisbee's, we just started throwing all of our old music into the dumpster. And at first you're like, oh, oh. But really, truly, by the end of this little exercise of, you know, a dozen or so albums, by the end of that little exercise, you know, our heart felt so free. What were we doing? We didn't even know. We were guarding our heart. Didn't even know it, really. Guarding our heart because at that season, I, just, I was just like new to the Lord, and I just wanted to fill my heart with his word and with his truth and with his joy. I didn't need all the other anxiety, evil, fearful stuff. Amen? So anyways, I tell you all that because, you know, back in the day, there was a lot of stuff we listened to, and then there was a change. Like, I can tell you all the songs from the 70s and 60s. I can tell you all the lyrics because that's what we listened to. I could not tell you a song from the 80s. You'd, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know if it's from the 80s or 90s. You know why? Because there was a distinct change. When I became a Christian, there was a distinct change in what went in the eye gates, the ear gates, and the mouth gate. Because now it's important to guard the heart so that the fruit that God wants to produce in and through my own personal life could begin to develop. I, I will go back and I will honestly say the music change was probably the biggest I quit smoking, yes. I quit getting high, yes. But I'll tell you the biggest change I made, the biggest change was I changed the music. Bigger than the other ones. I changed the music I was listening to and started putting in a different soundtrack. Okay, so music. We all know the power of music, but let's do a little experiment here, and let's talk about it just for a minute. The world soundtrack, a lot of the stuff you guys are going to know. And again, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's not evil. It's not bad. It's just fun. It kind of pumps you up if you're going to do something before you go do some sporting event or, you know, before you're going to... Start your day, you might want something that peps you up. But there's other music, I think you're catching what I'm saying, that maybe you don't need to have in your, in your playlist any longer. But this stuff here, 
music does something to you. In fact, they tell you when it comes to music, they, they say a lot of studies are being done for health reasons. They're doing a lot of work now with music and Alzheimer's patients because of the connection of music with memory, because of the connection with music with mood. And how many of you know you hear a song and doesn't it take you to a place? Doesn't it take you back to high school or to junior high or to a family reunion or to some time in your life? You can, you can smell it. You can remember where you were. You know who you were with. You kind of have those feelings again. Music has a way of doing time travel. Somebody said it this way. They said, you know, they've not perfected time travel, but maybe the closest thing to it is listening to music. It takes you somewhere. So let's do a little time travel, and let's see if any of these seem familiar to you, okay? Let's try. Anybody? Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Okay, let's try another one. The office. Okay. Does it take you somewhere when you hear these songs? Let's see. Some of you might remember this one. Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith Show. Got it? The Jetsons. How many of you, that took you back to your family room with a good old-fashioned console TV back in the day? Uh, let's give you a couple more. What are we doing? We're just saying music has a way of taking you places. To the Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger. Ready to move out. Batman. I'll give you a couple more. You guys like these? Let's see. Isn't that funny? Sounds, music, melodies. And you know, the funny thing is most of those TV show theme songs or some of those video game things, they're at the most one minute, at the most. So in less than 60 seconds, our lives, these are the memories of our lives. This kind of stuff changed our life. What was it? It was just the soundtrack of our life. And so we can intentionally put some things on a playlist and have things we are listening to intentionally to guard our heart and to cultivate this walk with God that he wants us to have. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, if you got your Bibles, Je Ze Zephaniah. Let's look at Zephaniah. I want you guys to see this. I just want to share a couple things, and then the team's going to come back out, and we're going to uh, put into practice some of what we're talking about. But when it comes to music, God's soundtrack, the soundtrack of our life, why this is important, what I hope you take away at the end of the day, okay, I'm going to give you the end. At the end of today, all I want you to do is I want you to drive around town and be living your life and, and then have this thought. Sing. Sing. Sing your song. Turn on your soundtrack. I mean, just sing more. Sing. Get that melody going in your heart. And Zephaniah 317, it says this about the Lord. It says, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. When it comes to music, when it comes to God's view of music, God's soundtrack, the reason this is so important is because it's so interesting. For whatever reason, God is into singing. He sings over you and I. Like, he's not mad at you. He's not scowling at you. He's not angry at you. He's not disappointed. 
the Bible says of the Lord, because of what Jesus did on the cross, listen, this is because of what Jesus did on the cross, this scripture has come to pass. And it is because of that, because our sins are forgiven, because he's washed our sins white as snow, when he looks at you and he looks at me, he sings over us. I think that's a weird thought sometimes to think about, especially if you grew up, maybe you didn't have the best relationship with your parents or your mom or your dad. And maybe you didn't hear bedtime melodies when you were put to bed as a kid. It shouldn't seem that weird that God sings over us because all of us as parents and grandparents, we remember how natural it was and how normal it was for us when we had little kids. Nobody taught you to do this. You just did it. You just sang to them. Where'd that come from? How did we know to do that? How did we know to make up songs to sing to them with their name in it and to take little nicknames they had? How did we know to take little nicknames and then create songs and sing it over our kids throughout their life and especially when we put them to bed? How did we know to do that? We just did it because we're parents and parents love their kids and we're just singing over them to soothe them before bed and just to love on them right? I mean, it's just normal for parents. But yet we read a scripture about God singing over us, and maybe sometimes we're like, I don't know what to do with that. Well, just don't do anything. Just allow it. (laughs) Just allow the Lord to sing over you. Allow your ear gates and your eye gates and your mouth gate. Allow it to go in to your heart and to recognize heaven has a soundtrack. God's into singing. He's into music. And the sooner you and I plug into it by also singing, man, the better for us. The reason that it's so interesting about music is you go back to the beginning. You go back to creation. The book of Job tells us that at the very beginning at creation, all the morning stars, the angels, sang at creation. Like all the big events of God in the Bible, we're going to find out they're singing. At creation, they're singing. At the very end, when Jesus comes again, when God wraps this stuff up, we go into the new heaven and the new earth. Did you know the very last thing, the last trigger, the very last thing before Jesus comes again is the last trumpet? It's a musical instrument. It's music. Then when Jesus was born, when the angel appeared to Mary and she found out she was carrying the Messiah, do you know the first thing she did The Bible tells us the first thing she did is she sang a song. It's called Mary's Magnificat. She sang a song, bless the Lord, O my soul. And she sang to the Lord. When Zechariah and Joseph found out about John the Baptist and Jesus, they sang. When the shepherds were on the hillside and the angels appeared in the sky to announce the birth of the Messiah, what did the angels do? They sang. Man, heaven is a place loaded with music. We we read in Revelations chapter 4 and 5 that the angels and the elders and all the heavenly beings are around the throne of God 24-7. It says forever and ever singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. They're singing forever. And then you get to Revelations 5 after Jesus went to the cross. And it says no one was able to open up the book. There was nobody that could break the seal and open up the book until Jesus went to the cross. And then they said, you are worthy to open the book. You are worthy, Jesus, to have the rest of your plan fulfilled. And it says in Revelations 5, then, they've been singing forever and ever and ever and ever, holy, holy, holy. It says, and then they sang a new song. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you. You're the only one worthy. You're the only one worthy in all creation. Nobody could open up this book. But because of your blood that was shed now, out of every kindred, every tribe, every people group, people can be saved. You're the only one worthy. And so now they sing a new song, forever and ever and ever, to Jesus. Heaven likes music. There's a soundtrack And we get so caught up on earth in the earthly soundtracks of life. But as the mom of the house, what I want to encourage you to do is tap into heaven's soundtrack. Out of your heart, you and I can tap into heaven's soundtrack. A couple uh, other quick little thoughts here. And then we're going to sing because I want you just to do it. But a couple thoughts. I think it's interesting in the Bible. In the 
Old Testament and in the New, anytime you read about a breakthrough or some kind of a breakout, do you know that every time it was accompanied with singing? And here we are, Valley Family Church, coming up on the tail end of our breakout year. Haven't we been declaring that all year? This is our breakout year. We've been declaring it all year. I feel like this is a word from the Lord. I really, truly do. I feel like this is a word from the Lord for our church and for many of you individually. We're coming up on the tail end of our breakout year. And it could be that you don't feel like you've seen a lot of movement quite yet. All I know is this. Every other big breakout, breakthrough in the Bible, they got the ultimate breakthrough with singing. They sang for it. Let me look at a couple of verses, and then I want to I wanna just talk about it. Uh, Psalm 32, verse 7. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Do you need deliverance? Are you, are you waiting on God for this breakout this year to get delivered from something? Listen, you're going to get delivered with songs. You're going to get to your breakout year with your heart, your mouth, singing. He surrounds us with songs of deliverance. This other verse in Psalm 68, verse 6, I love this. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. But the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. God leads out the prisoners. Man, if you feel like you've been bound all year and you're waiting for your freedom, he leads out the prisoners with singing. Acts chapter 16, remember the story of Paul and Silas? They'd been preaching the gospel. There's revival breaking out. The officials didn't like it. They put him in jail and said, you need to stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. And Paul was like, hey, we're still going to preach in his name. They locked him up in the innermost prison, locked him up in chains and and stocks and bonds. And the Bible says at the midnight hour, when it was the darkest, at the midnight hour, when they were locked up in chains, Paul and Silas started singing. They started singing praises to the Lord. So much so, the Bible says the prisoners heard them. They were singing loud. They were singing intentional. They got tuned into God's soundtrack. They plugged in to the Lord singing over them, and they just began to sing right back to the Lord. And the prisoners heard them, and then suddenly... There was a great earthquake, and their chains were busted off from them, and they were set free. And then they preached the gospel to the jailer, and his whole household got saved, and revival broke out in the prison. How did they get their breakout? How did Paul and Silas get their breakout, get their break free? How did the prisoners go free? They sang. They sang. They got a hold of their soundtrack. You look at Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament. They were surrounded by enemies. Jehoshaphat said, Lord, what are we going to do? And the Lord spoke and said, Jehoshaphat, here's the thing. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Jehoshaphat said, well, then what do we do? He sought the Lord. The next morning they got together and he says, okay, first things first. I'm appointing all the singers to go in front of the army. I'm appointing all the singers to go first. And you're going to sing, you know, Blessed be the Lord, his mercy endures forever. And we're just going to sing our way to victory. And do you know the Bible says, listen to this. The Bible says as soon, as soon as they started singing, not a minute before, but as soon as that first note, as soon as they started singing, the Lord sent ambushments. The Lord caused the enemies to become confused. So confused, they destroyed each other. And Jehoshaphat and the Israeli army just marched on to victory. What was, what was the cause of their breakout? What was the catalyst for their breakout? It was singing. As soon as they sang, as soon as they sang with some gusto, as soon as they sang words to the Lord, they got hooked into his soundtrack. Uh, Jack Hayford tells a story. Jack Hayford was a pastor, is a pastor in California. And um, he's a legend amongst many people that would know his name. And many of the early contemporary Christian music artists, when Contemporary Christian music first started uh, in the 70s. Groups like Second Chapter of Acts, among others, were out, came out of his church, okay? So he, he's, he's sort of known as the pastor who really embraced the beginnings of contemporary Christian music. But here's the backstory. 
The back story is he walked into this church that he was going to pastor, and as he walked into it, there was only about 25 members. It was a very small church. He walked into the building, and he said when he went in, it just felt so oppressive. It just felt, in fact, he called it hideously oppressive. There was a hideously oppressive spirit in the place is how he described it. He goes, it was reflected when he, you know, got up to preach the first couple of times. It was reflected in the response of the people. During worship, he said there was no life. There was no expression. There was no joy. There was no singing. It was just deadsville. When he preached the word, it was like the word, as alive as it is, was dead. There was nothing on it. There was no response. He could see it in the people. And he said, God, what am I going to do? What do I do? There's no formula for this. He just sought the Lord. And as he sought the Lord, he felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. He felt prompted that just from now on, when he walked in the building, he had to walk through the sanctuary to get to his office. He just felt like when he would walk into the building, he would just start clapping. And he would just start saying, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus, and start singing throughout the sanctuary, just singing praises to the Lord. And then he'd go to his office, work on some things, take his lunch break, go back into the sanctuary, do the same thing, just walk around the sanctuary, clapping and singing and just praising the Lord. And then he'd go back and work, and then he'd go home before he left the office that day. He'd do the same thing. He said, you know, it took about a year and a half. It didn't seem like a lot of, there didn't seem to be a lot of movement. But for just a year and a half, I kept doing that. He goes, and until one day, we had a breakout. Until one day, all of a sudden, it was as if the whole atmosphere of the place changed. There was a breakthrough, not just for the church at large, but for the people. He said, the Lord quickened to me, Isaiah 54, 1. Here's what it says. Sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud. He said it felt like the church was barren. There was no fruit. It was just dead. He says, but this says, sing, O barren, sing aloud and bring forth that fruit. Well, he did, and like I said, about a year and a half. But, you know, you might relate to several of these things. You might feel like, man, I feel barren in areas of my life. I feel like there's not enough fruit in areas of my life. I would have thought there'd be more fruit over here by now. Maybe you just feel like your relationships, your marriage, your children, your finances, you you pick the area. But if you feel a barrenness, maybe spiritually you just feel dead. You don't feel very alive and vibrant spiritually. What do you do? Sing, oh barren one. Sing, sing. Get a song in your mouth. Sing. Sing aloud and break forth. Two ways to do it. One way to do it is, of course, you can, you can uh, pop in a CD. You can turn on, put in your 8-track, your album. You can go to Spotify or Pandora. You can find a playlist. You can make a playlist. I do want to encourage you. I really highly want to encourage you. Man, we need music to be flowing all the time. It's easy to get out of that habit. It's easy just to have there be silence or have there be something not very encouraging, you know, floating through the, the airwaves. But I want to encourage you maybe after today just to go, you know, God, I want, to get, I want to get back to a place with you where music and singing and soundtracks is what filled my atmosphere. And so you can go on to Spotify or Pandora or something. You can create a playlist. There's so much music out there of good worship, Christian songs, things that will build you up. I put together one for you. If you guys want some help, you got a little handout here. These are the songs. Now, these are, a lot of these are oldies. A lot of these, you would hear these songs musically. Well, it's, a, it's very eclectic. There's no rhyme or reason to this list other than these are the songs that have been hitting my heart for 40 years. These are my go-to songs. If I need to get myself stirred up to seek the Lord, I listen to the songs on the top half. If I need to get stirred up and get compassion for the lost, I just want to remember my life before I knew the Lord. I want to remember the people in my world that don't know Jesus. I listen to these songs to get stirred up about reaching the lost. If I want to stir up my faith, I want to get built up in my faith and filled with the Spirit. I've got a whole different collection of songs on this list that I listen to. And just like, just like we know with music, man, it just changes your mood. It changes your whole disposition. And you get your eye gate and your ear gate and your mouth gate hooked up and synced up with heaven's soundtrack. It does something to your heart. And again, all the issues of life come out of our hearts. So I want to encourage you one way 
to get your soundtrack going is literally to make one. Get a soundtrack made, get a, a playlist made, and get some songs going. The other thing to do is to sing out of your own heart, to sing out of your own heart songs that God will put there. I can think about seasons in my life, different seasons in my life where certain songs just bubbled up. I remember one time I was working a job and um, I took my lunch break and I was feeling anxiety and you know, feeling kind of stressed out. And I took my lunch break and as I was walking to lunch, I just thought I'm gonna start singing. I knew enough to know, even as a new Christian, I knew the power of music. And so I just started to sing words out of my own heart. Like, what's bubbling up, you know? And the only thing that kind of bubbled up was, um, I said, Lord, I started singing to the Lord, no more striving, no more toiling. I've decided not to spin. I'm finally realizing efforts in my flesh are sin. Um, Lord, I am resting in your presence. I'm relaxed when I'm with you. I'm receiving an abundance of your spirit and his fruit. No more toiling, no more striving. These were the words to the song. I was just singing those to the Lord to sort of decompress. Quit striving. Quit being so anxious about things. Just rest in the Lord. Quit toiling and spinning. Just calm down. Well, that was from a scripture in Matthew chapter 5. That was just words that bubbled up. I sang them on my way to lunch. I mean, there's been many songs over the years, and many of you would have the same testimony. You might think, well, I don't have any words that bubble up. Like, I mean, maybe that will happen for me. I'd, I'd like that to happen. It will happen. If you'd, if you'd like it to happen, it will happen. But maybe it's just a scripture. Maybe you pull a scripture, a Bible verse out of the Bible, and you're like, I want to memorize this. I want this scripture to be a part of my life. I don't want it just to be ink on a page. I want that to be my life. The best way for that to become your life is to sing it. I worked at a leather factory years ago uh, after college out in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. I was there for the summer. I worked at this leather factory, and we were, you know, working all day tanning leather. And I would just write on index cards some scriptures. And to memorize those, to have those become a part of me, I would sing those during the day. I'd make up a melody and just sing them. Well, do you know to this day, now I worked in that leather factory in 1979. Do you know to this day, 2019, I can recall those songs instantly. Psalm 5. How does it start? Psalm 5. Um, oh, Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Give ear to my words, O oh Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King. See, you don't have to be a good singer. <laughs> That's okay. He just wants a joyful noise. <laughs> he just wants a joyful noise. But see, that psalm is in me. I did the very same thing with Psalm 25. I was seeking God about direction, and there was a chunk of Psalm 25. And, it, and so I'm standing at the tanning booth. I can remember it like it's yesterday. I'm standing there, and I'm singing, Show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, and guide me in your truths, and teach me for you are my God and my Savior. O Lord, teach me my hope is in you, my God and my Savior all day long. Little, you know, little vibrato there. Thank you. So the point is you don't have to be a good singer, but you just have to put a melody to scriptures. And then they become a part of you. Like Psalm 25 and Psalm 5, I feel like I own them. I, obviously I don't, but in my walk with the Lord, I do. So what scriptures, besides all of them, does the Lord want you to sing and becomes a part of your soundtrack, becomes a part of your history with God? It's what makes God real to you. Many times I would take a hymnal, good old-fashioned hymnal. Maybe I'm at home or back in the day in my dorm. I'd open it up. I can't play instruments, and I don't know how to read music that well, but I'd open it up. I'd kneel by my bed or by the chair, and I'd start turning to a hymn. I'd be like, well, Lord, I don't know this melody, but I love these words. Like, here's one, standing on the promises. I'd sing it, you know, standing on the promises of Christ, my King. Lord, I'm so glad I can do that. You're my King. Yes, and I can stand on your promises. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. 
glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. God, I am standing. Lord, you know that scripture I'm standing on. I am standing on that because I can do it. And I thank you for your strength today. Well, then maybe I do that. Then I flip to another one. Maybe I come to another one. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Lord, this is the best. I'm so glad I know you. I'm so glad you're mine, and I am yours. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. Lord, search my heart. What, what is in my heart that's not pleasing to you? God, I resign from it. I don't want it in my life. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. And then you just talk to the Lord. You sing, you talk. You're, you're building a soundtrack. You're building a life with God. Whether you can sing or not, it's your melody coming out of your heart. It's words from his word. It's words from a hymnal. It's words from your heart. Amen. Denise and Karen are going to sort of demonstrate to you guys how to just yield to the Lord and sing a song out of your own heart without it already existing. Like it'll be a spontaneous song from their heart. Sometimes I just like to tell him how good he is and how much I love him. And you could sing this after me. I just wrote this kind of when I was just sitting in God's presence. When my heart is overwhelmed 
are faithful, you're the way maker, you're the chain breaker, everything I need is in your name, so I say Jesus, I say Jesus, in my darkest hour I say his name Jesus, someone say Jesus, I say his name Jesus, Jesus, everything's found in your name, Jesus. Sometimes you might hear the Lord actually singing over you, where it's not you singing to him. He's saying to you, I'm faithful to you. Come on. You can trust me. I'll never fail you one time. Because I will never lie. There's never a shadow in which to hide because I'm your light and my love's poured out on you so you can rest in me I'll meet all your needs for I So hear him say this that I rejoiced over you with singing this morning. I dance and spin, I leap over you, my creation. So I want you to know there is no condemnation this morning. So take off the condemnation that you're feeling, take off oppression this morning. Because in my presence, it's full. Of joy, fullness of joy, fullness of joy, shouts of joy, fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And I hear him say, I rejoice over you. I rejoice over you, my beautiful one, my beloved one, my righteous one. Because of me, I rejoice over you. 